Twas early in a fine summer's morning as I strolled by the third week of March 1846, the growing fears over a looming famine were continuing to rise across Ireland. However, around the town of Newport in Tipperary, another topic of conversation was providing a welcome, if macabre, distraction. In the houses that lined the Anglesey Road, which trailed out of Newport into the Shreve Phelan Mountains, people watched with eager anticipation for the latest developments in the sensational story emanating from the Berkeley House in Toreen Bryan. Since the early hours of March the 11th, they had seen increased traffic on the normally quiet mountain road. When the farm labourer, William Walsh, was led down the road towards Newport by the police, they began to realise something was wrong. Then the news began to filter out that Daniel Berkery, a farmer up at Turin Bryan, was gravely wounded. The story had taken a sensational twist when later in the day, Berkery's wife Ellen had also been arrested. Throughout that first day of March the 11th, the story had continued to build. While the police brought the suspects to Newport, Dr Carey, the town doctor, had been spotted travelling towards the Berkery house. When the physician returned a few hours later, the inquisitive bystanders tried to cross-examine his expressions to decipher what he had seen. The more perceptive knew it wasn't good. Having examined Daniel Berkery, Dr Carey noted his catastrophic injuries and later recalled, I saw him on the day after he was beat. He had on the left side of the head four extensive outs. Those on the forepart were more extensive and the skin lacerated. The whole of the bones on the left side were broken to pieces. With a shattered skull, it was only a matter of time before Daniel Berkery died. But while he lingered on in his bed, the drama of the case continued to build around him. On March 12th, the most celebrated visitor these communities had seen in many a long year appeared. The arrival of Richard Penfarther underscored just how serious the authorities were taking the case. Indeed, for Ellen Berkery and William Walsh, news that a member of the Penfarther family was travelling to Turin Bryan was a sobering realisation of what they now faced. The Penfathers were like the Waller family who had developed Newport. They were descendants of Cromwellian settlers, but they had risen high in Irish society, becoming leading judges and solicitors. Richard, the man heading to Turin Bryan, had chosen a different career, however, having become a civil servant, and by 1846 he was the Under Secretary for Ireland, one of the leading civil servants on the island. Presumably having visited family who resided just outside of Newport, Penfather took time to visit the Berkery household and initiate an investigation. He would later provide a detailed report to the authorities in Dublin Castle, which was then in turn handed over to the police. Although oblivious to the details in his report, it was utterly disastrous for Ellen Berkery. Having visited the Berkery household, Penfather had a very good understanding of exactly what had happened. I visited the injured man two days after this occurrence, but he was incapable of giving evidence, and I then took the examination of the family, which led me to suppose that this outrage was perpetrated by the wife of the deceased, and a man of the name of Walsh, who lived in the house for eight or nine months under rather suspicious circumstances with the wife. In the following days, newspapers caught wind of the story, and soon Irish emigrants in England were reading accounts which speculated on whether Daniel lived or died. Remarkably, he hung on until St. Patrick's Day 1846, when the news finally emerged that Daniel Berkery had passed away. The now widowed Ellen Berkery and her lover William Walsh faced a murder charge, which carried with it a death sentence. Indeed, the following day the legal system swung into action. Most cases saw the accused first brought before a local court, where the magistrate would decide whether or not to send them forward for a full trial at the county assizes, a court that convened four times a year in the town of Nina. However, there was also a way in which this system could be accelerated. In all instances of suspicious or unexplained deaths, inquests to determine a cause of death had to take place. If the inquest jury was confident enough to name suspects, the coroner, a powerful figure in the 19th century legal system, could decide to send the accused straight to the assizes and dispense with the need for a local trial before the magistrate. 
When Daniel Burkery's inquest took place less than 24 hours after his death, the evidence presented before the coroner's court was utterly damning. But before we go to the inquest and hear these testimonies from those who were in the house on the night in question, let's get the intros out of the way. My name is Finn DeWire. This is the Irish History Podcast and you're listening to part three of Murder at Mother Mountain. Additional research is from Liam Costello. Narrations are from Aidan Crow and Therese Murray. The series was funded through the generous support of listeners on Patreon and Acast Plus, and the theme tune is The Banks of Ceylon, performed by Nell Necronine and played on the pipes by Liam Costello. Now, let's get to that inquest. Strolled down by the banks of on March the 18th, 1846, the Newport coroner, James Carl, travelled to Turin Bryan to hold an inquest on Daniel Burkery's body. Where precisely it took place is unclear, but it may have even been in the deceased man's house. While Daniel's body was the key piece of evidence and the jurors crowded around it, the key witness was Ellen Burkery Jr. That's the daughter of Ellen and the now deceased Daniel. While her mother or her co-accused William Walsh did not appear at the inquest, her evidence, which you are about to hear, was truly damning. I am the daughter of the deceased Daniel Burkery. I remember the night of the 10th. My mother, father, three sisters, three brothers and Patrick Hayes, the servant, were in the house. About half past eight after we had eaten supper, I and my two sisters, Catherine and Honora, went to bed. In the course of the night, I was awakened by my mother, who had her petticoat about her shoulders, clapping her hands and crying, Ellen, Ellen, your father is killed. I saw William Walsh going from the bed in which my father lay. He had a hatchet in his hand. I heard my mother say it was four black boys that killed my father. I knew at the time that it was Walsh who killed him because I saw him leave the room with the hatchet in his hand. She added her own motive, one also referenced by Richard Penfather. When he first came to our house, William also slept with my father and mother. I recollect on one occasion my father got up out of bed before daybreak to go to the fair of Capamore and left Walsh in bed after him with my mother. Ellen Jr. was followed by Grace, her 19-year-old sister, who backed up her testimony. Then there were numerous other witnesses, Constable Michael Foy, who had been on the scene immediately after the attack. Dr Kitson testified to the nature of the injuries Daniel had suffered, confirming them to be the cause of death. Then the Berkeley servant, Patrick Hayes provided further damning evidence. He appeared to suggest that the murder may have been planned or that Ellen at least had some knowledge something was going to happen. Hayes, who slept in the loft above the kitchen, remembered. Previous to my going to bed, the deceased wife desired me to shut the trap door to the loft to keep out the wind. On going to bed, I closed the trap when one of the women, I think it was the deceased's wife, fastened it closed. This was never done before. Ultimately, the decision of the jury was never in doubt. When they returned a verdict of willful murder against Ellen and William, few can have been surprised. The coroner had little doubt himself and he sent the pair directly for trial at the Assizes, meaning there was no local hearing at all. While the case would only go to a full trial when the Assizes were convened, the evidence already presented was the basis of a cast-iron case. Richard Penfather who had actually attended the inquest, would write to the authorities of Dublin Castle, spelling this out. There are many corroborating circumstances which leave no doubt that Walsh murdered the man. This inquest ruling had huge consequences for Ellen as well though. The two of them had both been sent forward, accused of murder, and they were now about to embark on a fight for their lives. The following morning, they took their first steps on an odyssey through the 19th century legal system a world completely alien to the one where Ellen and William Walsh had grown up. On March the 18th, they were removed from their cells in Newport and transferred to Nina Jail. The prison was just over 15 miles northeast of Newport, but this short journey must have been an emotional one. If the couple had any sense of what lay ahead, they surely knew they might never see each other again. There was also something less apparent, but one that would have a much greater impact on their lives. 
As the horse-drawn wagon plodded northeastwards towards Nina, they travelled up the Turnpike Road, the same road Ellen had travelled down countless times during her childhood as she went to Newport from her home on Keeper Hill. Indeed, for a few miles, Keeper Hill dominated the landscape to the west, and behind it somewhere, obscured from view, was Mother Mountain, symbolic of this world she had grown up in, but one they might never see again, depending on what happened at the trial. However, whether they knew it or not, they would endure extreme hardships in the prison system before they ever sat in a dock. New radical ideas had transformed how prisons operated and how prisoners were viewed and treated. This alone would transform Ellen and William Walsh in fundamental ways. While they were being torn from the world they grew up in, they would not be the same after what they were about to be subjected to, no matter what happened at the trial. Their arrival at Nina Jail on March 19th started a new life in many ways for Ellen and William. The consequences at stake were starkly brought into view as they approached the prison greathouse. This was the one wing of Nina Jail that the wider public was familiar with, but it was also the most notorious. The gatehouse was where condemned prisoners were taken two weeks before their execution date and then they were hanged from a gallows above the gate. Passing under that arch, William and Ellen couldn't avoid but looking up at the narrow door in the archway above where the condemned prisoners took their final steps to the gallows. Once inside the jail, they fully appreciated that Nina was a very different prison to Newport Bridewell. Indeed, the two were scarcely comparable. One of a raft of prisons constructed under the recent 1839 Prisons Act, it was unlike any structure or institution William or Ellen had ever seen. Passing through the gatehouse, they entered a world of total control. William was brought into the male prison. This was dead ahead of the gatehouse and laid out like a cartwheel. At the centre, the governor's house doubled as an administration block, while seven wings and seven separate exercise yards radiated out in all directions. Behind this, in a completely separate compound, was the smaller female prison. Opened four years earlier, the jail had been carefully designed to implement revolutionary new ideas about how prisoners should be treated. In 1843, the Inspector General of Prisons, James Palmer, had visited Nina Jail and later recorded, It is remarkable how much may be affected by commencing on a good system. The good systems that he was referring to were known as the separation system and the silent system. This maintained that the ideal prison regime kept all prisoners isolated from each other and stopped them communicating with each other as well, believing this would give them time to reflect on their crimes and ultimately lead to their reformation as people. The effect was to crush the prisoners' will to live. Unsurprisingly, suicide in these institutions was extremely high. At Nina, the authorities strived towards implementing this system. The Inspector General of Prisons, James Palmer, described the jail in 1843 in the following terms. There are four criminal male classes and four female, and a considerable degree of silence is preserved, and absence of evil communication amongst the prisoners but the total separation of prisoners is not yet practised. By 1846, as crime soared during the famine, the increasing numbers in the jail limited the authorities' ability to enforce complete separation, but it was strived towards nonetheless. And even though William and Ellen had not yet been convicted of any crime, prisoners on remand, like them, were frequently treated the same as convicts. Inside the jail, their days were occupied with boring tasks. Men made mats, sacks, broke stones and saw timber. There was also a thread wheel, an enormous wheel, where the prisoners, like hamsters, walked aimlessly. The lucky prisoners worked in the less alienating workshops as blacksmiths, carpenters and tailors. During working hours, silence was also maintained. It's difficult to imagine a world more removed from the one where Ellen and William had grown up. Surrounded by the vast open space of the mountains, there was always someone to talk to in what was often a very crowded house. Indeed, Ellen, once the master of her own destiny, found herself now stripped of all autonomy. Her days were spent in a hot, stuffy but silent laundry, or spinning yarn, or carding wool. The control was not just in physical terms either. On their arrival in the prison, the authorities took down 
minute details about who they were, measuring their height and noting their complexion, their eye colour, their hair colour, their religion and whether they could read or write. They also recorded what crime they had been accused of. During this process, it appears Ellen may have had an eye on what was coming down the line, however. While she was 43 years of age at the time, Ellen told the authorities she was only 38. Now, one might expect Ellen would add a few years to her age, possibly to provoke sympathy from a jury. However, there was method in this strange move. As Dr. Neve Howland will explain in the interview coming on Wednesday, Ellen may well have been conscious of the fact that being eight years older than William Walsh, this could make her seem like the person who had orchestrated the murder. Putting herself closer in age to William, at the very least, would have made them co-conspirators. This would prove to be a mistake. Separated from William, her fellow prisoners, and indeed the world, Ellen passed day by silent day and month by lonely month in the spring and summer of 1846 in Nina Prison, waiting for her trial. June the 19th, 1846, was one of the rare days when the monotonous regime of the prison was shattered by the sounds of a large crowd assembling outside the jail, but this only deepened Ellen's growing anxiety. The crowds had come for the execution of three men, Patrick Rice, William Fogarty and Patrick Hayes. They had gained a celebrity status after being convicted of conspiracy to murder a landowner, Patrick Clark, who had evicted Hayes' elderly mother. The three condemned men had become wildly popular. While they protested their innocence, few had sympathy with the landowner, Clark, who had evicted an old woman. When a depressed groan went up from the multitude outside the jail, the prisoners inside knew the hangman had carried out his grim task. Ellen undoubtedly feared that she and William Walsh could well be the next convicts to follow Rice, Fogarty and Hayes on the gallows if their case went against them. Having been separated from each other from the moment they arrived in the prison on March 19th, Ellen and William were reunited again in the worst possible circumstances on August 3rd. This reunion took place in a dark tunnel beneath Nina Jail, which linked the prison to the nearby courthouse. There, in the dim light, the two saw each other again, both presumably showing the strains of confinement. Above them, in the crowded courthouse, a judge, a jury, the prosecution, and perhaps most distressing of all, Ellen's children awaited them. They hadn't come to support their mother. They were, in fact, the main prosecution witnesses. However, in what was a significant development a few days earlier, the pre-trial hearings, which Ellen and William did not attend, had seen a decision passed down that changed the course of Ellen's life. These proceedings had actually begun four days earlier, on Friday the 31st of July, 1846. This had seen the judge, Baron Lefroy, impanel what was called a grand jury. This grand jury was tasked with reviewing the cases before the courts that summer in Nina and decide whether there was sufficient evidence for full hearings to go ahead. While the deliberations of the grand jury were held in secret, there was no question Ellen and William would go forward for trial. However, the ruling of the grand jury had a huge bearing on Ellen's case. They decided she would not stand trial for murder, but instead be charged as an accessory after the fact. This changed the punishments Ellen possibly faced if she was found guilty. While William Walsh was still accused of murder, faced the noose. The worst sentence that could be passed down on Ellen was transportation, meaning if found guilty she would be shipped to a penal colony in Australia to serve her sentence. Either way, it was clear if the pair were found guilty, the lives they had known up to this point would be at an end, either on the gallows or a convict ship to the other side of the world. Before continuing, I just want to take this time to thank you again for your support. As a show supporter listening on Acast Plus or Patreon, you were key to producing this series. As I said before, researching a case like this takes a lot of time. There were no summaries, articles or books available to help me with the details of Ellen's life. As I've said, this was a never before told story, so it was all new research. And given the show receives no funding or grants, it really was just you, the listeners, who made it happen. Thanks so much. We talked on together in hailing this
sweet, pleasant air. Whatever fleeting comforts Ellen and William could offer each other in the dark tunnel that linked the prison to the courthouse did not last long. The trial began and the judge summoned them into the court. As they ascended the steps from the tunnel on August 3rd, they stepped into a tense room. Amidst the crowd of busy clerks, solicitors and barristers, Ellen scanned the strange environment, catching a glimpse of a few familiar faces. Her older children, Ellen, Honora, Jeremiah and Catherine, were all present. Some neighbours from Toreen Bryan were also there. Her tenants, Richard Rolls and Mick Blake, along with her cousin, Andrew Bowen. However, these familiar faces offered no solace. They were all there to testify for the prosecution. As she took in the room, there was an absence that may have offered her the slightest of hope in that moment. One of her daughters, the second eldest, Grace, was not present. Ellen surely pondered over her absence. She had, after all, testified at Daniel's inquest. However, if Ellen thought Grace had had a change of heart, she was mistaken. Although she could not fully appreciate it, in the six months since she had been arrested on March the 11th, the crisis in wider society arising from the failure of the potato crop, had deepened. A full-blown famine had set in when the crop had failed for a second year in a row. Disease was spreading fast and Grace had been struck down with a fever and was sick in the workhouse hospital in Nina. For William Walsh, he may have felt truly alone in the courthouse. There was never any mention of friends or family coming to support him. It's hardly any surprise, though, if his wife had abandoned him to his fate Yet he must have been able to take some comfort from being around Ellen. In what was a rare glimpse of the genuine affection she seems to have felt for him, one eyewitness recorded Ellen's demeanour in the court. In the dock, the great object of her attention was the male prisoner. She seemed forgetful or regardless of her own position and evidently felt for nothing and thought of nothing but the peril in which her paramour was placed. Her large, full, black eyes was frequently fixed on him with painful intensity. When the case began, the evidence presented was the same damning testimonies that had been so compelling at the inquest. Ellen's oldest daughter, Ellen Jr., mounted the stand recalling the terrible night, being awoken by her mother screaming her father was dead, William Walsh leaving the room with a bloodied axe. In terms of the new charge facing her mother, that had been an accessory after the fact, the recollection of hearing Ellen claim black boys had attacked her father when the evidence indicated she was covering up for Walsh was damning. She also confirmed her mother and William Walsh were having an affair, saying she had seen them in bed, something that shocked the public gallery. When the 21-year-old concluded her testimony, she left the witness box and crossed the court. Rage flared in her mother and Ellen Sr., lunged towards her eldest daughter, shouting, I am sorry I ever reared such a girl. Ellen Jr. was followed to the stand by a stream of witnesses, Ellen's children, Honora and Jeremiah, and then Pat Hayes, who had all been in the house on the night in question. Andrew Bowen, her own cousin, testified that he had seen inappropriate behaviour between Ellen and William Walsh at Christmas 1845, which indicated they were lovers. This provided motive. Richard Rolls and Mick Blake testified that they had not been in the Berkeley's house on the night in question, as William Walsh had tried to claim. They were also followed by several policemen and a doctor. In a moment that encapsulated the tragedy of the hearing, Ellen's ten-year-old daughter, Catherine, mounted the stand to provide evidence against her own mother, but when it became clear she did not really understand the meaning of the oath, the judge decided she couldn't testify. Over the course of the trial, the prosecution not only mounted a strong case that William Walsh had killed Daniel Berkery, but demonstrated that Ellen had tried to provide cover for him. They were also able to tear the defendant's weak defence apart. When the trial ended, the jury were dismissed, and 40 minutes later they returned. The result was delivered in one word. Guilty. Ellen and William were then removed from the court, brought back into the dark tunnel, and over to Nina Jail. In the solitude, silence and isolation of their prison cells, they reflected and waited with apprehension for their sentencing. Having been convicted on a Friday, they remained in their cells until all the hearings at the Assizes were completed the following Monday. Then, in that afternoon, they along with all the other prisoners were brought back into the court. At 3.30, the judge began to hand down sentences. Detention was unbearable. 
The case of Ellen and William, the most serious before the court, was left until the very last. The clerk of the court read the charges and asked Ellen and William if they had anything to say. Neither replied. Then the judge began to speak, and it did not bode well. William Walsh and Ellen Berkeley, I am now called upon to discharge the most painful duty which has ever devolved upon me. It is the most solemn duty which a judge is called upon to discharge, that of pronouncing the sentence of law upon one convicted of murder and upon one guilty of screening the murderer of her husband, an offence not only against the laws of the country, but repugnant to the laws both of God and man. Whether William Walsh was fully aware is unclear, but in this case the judge did not have any choice in his sentence. Reading aloud to the court, Baron Lefroy began, William Walsh, it now becomes my painful duty to tell you that you have but a short period to live in this world. The doors of mercy are here closed against you for ever. Then, placing a black cap on his head, he sentenced William to be hanged less than three weeks later on August 22nd. William, shocked, could only say, Oh my Lord, long day. When the judge went on to utter the formulaic words, May the Lord have mercy on your soul, William, in a state of shock, looked towards heaven and could only blurt out the response, Amen. The judge then turned to Ellen. What he would do in her case was less clear-cut, given he had greater latitude. He showed no mercy, adopting the harshest sentence possible, calling her an unnatural mother, guilty of an unnatural crime, and Ellen was sentenced to transportation to Australia for life. Ellen finally collapsed and had to be supported by the jailers on either side of her. As Ellen was brought down from the court, she caught a final glimpse of the world she had known as it faded away. Her children, her neighbours and the man she had loved and ultimately lost everything for, William Walsh. Once he was taken below, she feared she would never see him again. Returned to their cells that night, the two now reflected on their very different futures. They had previously been able to take solace in the fact that they would face whatever came together. That bond was also at an end. What precisely had happened back in Touring Bryan on March 10th still remained a secret between the two. There was little doubt they were guilty. William had killed Daniel, while Ellen, at the very least, had helped cover up the crime. But so much remained unclear. Was the murder premeditated? Much of the evidence covered in the last two episodes indicated this may have been the case. For example, why was the murder weapon, the family axe, close to the bed on the night in question when Ellen Jr. said it was normally stored in another room in the house? Why were the boys shut into the attic? Certainly, if the attack was being planned in advance, Ellen and William Walsh may have been worried Jeremiah would intervene to defend his father. Finally, the severity of Ellen's sentence does hint at the possibility that the judge did not believe she was just guilty of reacting to a murder after it happened. However, he could only pass down a sentence for the charge she had been convicted of. Did the judge believe she had played a more instrumental role in the murder and perhaps handed her down the harshest possible sentence in light of this? August 1846 would prove to be probably the worst month in Ellen Berkeley's life. Within hours of her sentence being handed down, her second eldest daughter, Grace, only 19 years of age, died from fever in Nina Workhouse, becoming an early victim of the famine. A journalist from Nina reflected on this situation as it broke. What a warning against crime. What a multitude of calamities have befallen this family within a brief period of time. A father murdered. A wife extirpated forever from her offspring and her home. There was one final possibility of hope though for the two prisoners. They could appeal their sentences to the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland and beg him to commute William's death sentence and perhaps lower Ellen's sentence of transportation. William's case was extremely urgent. On August 8th he was moved to the condemned cells in the gatehouse of Nina Jail. From this cell he could look back through the prison and beyond the governor's house to the women's jail where Ellen was being held but she might as well have been a world away. Day by day passed by. He was held in solitary confinement allowed only one hour of exercise each day in a claustrophobic yard. 
unless something dramatic happened, he would die on August 22nd, 1846. Next week, in part four, we will continue this story. Meanwhile, on Wednesday, Dr. Neve Howlin joins me for a deep dive to explain the 19th century legal system and how a court case like this worked at the time. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>